Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to host this daily gathering of folks around the world. Every day, we learn so much on this show, and we're grateful to everyone who joins us. Today is episode number 125. That's right, 125 episodes in 125 days of New York City lockdown. We're having an open mic. We're giving you a chance to come on the air and talk to us. We're giving you a chance to share your comments. Just post them in the comments that you're watching right now on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. And we will read your comments out loud. And if you'd really like to join us backstage or on stage, let us know that as well. But your friends and family would like to hear from you and also watch this show. So please tag them in Facebook and please retweet on Twitter and on YouTube and share on LinkedIn. Tag them. They can watch live or later. We're going to meet some fabulous guests along the way. And we're also going to take your questions. On the screen, you can see that I love Bitmoji. And I've been using it to talk about all the stuff that's been going on in the world. And here you can see that on this show for 125 days, we focused on COVID-19. We focused on the economic hardship. And since the death of George Floyd, we've also focused on Black Lives Matter. Please share. Please tag. Tell us where you're watching from. We want to hear from you and we want you to join us. We'll also tell you what's coming up this week. We have another full week of fabulous guests. We're gonna get started in just a minute, and let me say hi to everybody. Hello, folks. I'm here on our last night on Fire Island. This is an island off of Long Island, about an hour outside New York City, and I'm here with my wife and kids and dog, and we are quarantining after 100 days of quarantining in Manhattan. And I want to welcome everybody and tell you that I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism, and so grateful to everybody who has supported the show for 125 days. It seems like just yesterday we were celebrating the 100th episode, and here we are 25 days later. We want to hear from you. Tell us where you're watching from. Tell us what you're thinking. Tell us what you want to know, and let's talk. We have some great guests who will be with us in just a minute. As always, we want to start by thanking our sponsors because they make it possible for us to share all this great content with you. Our sponsors include Muckrack Academy, Fundamentals of Social Media for journalists, PR pros, and everyone. All of you can join and take this course. It's a free certification course. More than 4,000 people have taken it mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. We focus on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And so many people are telling us how useful they found the course. We also want to thank our friends who have made this possible through all the sponsors over the last 125 days. And we'll be thanking our current sponsors as well. But we want to bring on our producers who made this show possible. For 125 days, these two ladies have worked with me every single day remotely to bring you this show. And I can't tell you how grateful I am to them for their hard work, their teaching me so many things, and helping us bring you this show into the world. So please welcome Rose Horowitz and Vandana Menon. Here's Vandana. Hi, Vandana. Hello. Wow, I can't believe it's 125 already. And here's Rose. Hi. Hi. How are you both doing? I don't know. I'm, I'm measuring life in 20 in 25. You know, I was just thinking, well, when is 150 going to be? You know, yeah. like, maybe we should just wait till 200 at this point. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but we get a chance just to, to see, uh, you know, our guests who are going to join us and, and yeah. see each other. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, you know, one of the best things we did was start numbering the shows. I mean, it's not <laughs> typical when you watch television. They don't tell you this is Chris Cuomo's 2000 show or anything like that, but we thought it would be a great way to kind of mark the lockdown, which we thought was maybe 
few weeks, maybe a month or so, and here we are 125 days later. Let me ask each of you to talk a little bit about the show and what you learned doing this. You know, one of my uh, slogans is hashtag always be learning. And that's why in part we're doing this show. So let me start with you, Rose. What have you, some things you've learned? And then we'll go to Vandana. Well, I'm learning how to be on on camera. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've, uh, I've always been, I started as a print journalist. So this has um, been a, a journey and a lot of fun for the times that I am um, on camera. Uh, but I really enjoyed uh, the range of guests that we've had, you know, being able to meet so many people from around the world, from, you know, scientists. Uh, the, we had um, chief scientists for the WHO, and uh, I've been able to, interview some of the people online that I did want to follow profiles of. Um, just, uh, when was it, June, July 9th, I think. <laughs> we, had, um, we had Michelle Goodwin on, who uh, who is the last uh, woman to follow profile I, I did. And I, right before the show went to air, I posted um, profile my profile of her on Medium. And she's just terrific. Uh, she is, uh, a host of a new uh, podcast from his magazine called On, On the Issues. So, I've, I've, you know, and um, other women to follow have been Rupa and uh, Kelly Kelly Hoey and Marcy Albahar. Albahar. Um, so, you know, it's just been grand to to meet all these guests, and also, of course, I'm always up on the news because I, you know, we, the show is based on what's going on. And of course, knowing too much about the news can also be very difficult. And one of the things that we did by doing the show every single night and day uh, for 125 days is that we didn't give you a chance to kind of take time off from the news. And so for that, I apologize uh, for uh, for adding to your burden in this way. Uh, let's go to Vandana. Vandana, what have you learned? And before we do that, I should have just said more clearly, for those of you joining us for the first time, Rose Horowitz is uh, an award-winning journalist and she is the uh, creator of the hashtag women to follow and she's at rose horowitz 31 please follow her and check out her work and the women to follow hashtag is incredible and you should definitely check that out and now meet vandana menon vandana uh, is a journalist from india who's here to study for a year or so she thought at the university of pennsylvania and then she got caught in the lockdown yeah, it's a, definitely a strange time to graduate. Um, I finished my master's here, I wrapped that up in December, and then I was looking for jobs and um, the pandemic hit, so I've been freelancing since then. Um, what what have I learned so much? I, I thought I knew everything about social media. I spent all of my time online, but um, through the show, I've got to like um, learn so much more about these platforms that I, that I thought I knew everything about. I've learned a lot about StreamYard, which is what we use. And I've also met so many incredible people, and it's all and it's been like informing my journalism as well. I've uh, got to, got some great story ideas from the people that I met, so it's been it's been a wonderful learning experience. Great. Well, uh, before I bring on our other guests, we must thank a lady who makes this possible. Apart from the two of you, you folks are doing the work on the show, but my wife Rupa, who is an incredible support for me and uh, an inspiration to me in everything I do. Uh, she is here. Uh, I, I asked her to join us and uh, so that she can also talk. Uh, you should know that uh, she's gonna say some very nice things about the show and everything else, but you should know that this lady and my 17 year old twins who've been on the show, they both, the three of them without asking me, went to our neighbor and said, you gotta let him use the apartment that they had vacated and uh, so that otherwise we're gonna kill him because of all this live streaming he's doing and shouting into the, in our living room. And uh, otherwise he's going to, you know, we'll need the, we'll kill him and then we'll need your apartment for the wake and the funeral. So you take it, you make your choice. So that's, that. I just wanted you to hear that story before she says all the nice things she's about to say. So I wanna say to Rupa, thank you for everything you've done and let me bring you on here and say hi. Hello, hello. Uh, I can't believe everything this man says. Um, I think we did it for you, darling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you convinced me that that was for my sake. So thank that's you. That's right. I that's right. I uh, appreciate that. So what has it been like to live with somebody who's uh, live streaming for 125 days? 
Well, I, I think that, like you said to uh, to Rose and Vandana, I've, I've always felt like I'm on top of the news. And I've also found that I sort of find time to take these snippets that I see and send on to you because I keep thinking what's going to what's going to be important for Sri to know going into this um, the, the next in quotes news cycle. So um, it's been it's been fascinating also to watch the effort that goes into this and uh, what it takes to make something this uh, fascinating. I mean, really high quality work and journalism in a way. Right. And some amazing um, guests that I think it's in a way I don't know that you'd have um, they'd have had the time to do a show like this in the past. But um, like the chief scientist of the WHO, I mean, that's the kind of uh, get that uh, that I'm sure, you know, uh, it's hard for journalists to keep, keep at it every day for 125 days. So that's pretty, pretty amazing. Hats off. <laughs> yeah, and, and thank you. And uh, thanks to everyone who supports their spouses, loved ones in the middle of this pandemic, uh, for everybody who's been creative, everyone who's done a uh, some kind of pandemic project, uh, anyone in your life who has helped you do that, uh, it really makes a difference. Otherwise, we couldn't do what we do. I know Rose has incredible support. Uh, London has a lot of remote support. And mm -hmm. all of that has mattered. So I just really wanted Rupa to be here so that she can kind of stand in for everyone who has uh, uh, who has helped all of us, not in just in this show, but all our projects and tolerated uh, lots of different things. Rupa is a, a strategy consultant and works for Harman, uh, one of the big tech companies. And Rupa, what did you learn from watching these these kinds of shows? And just during the pandemic, what have you learned for yourself about uh, what you can do and what others uh, should be thinking about as well? Well, there's sort of three layers of it. One is I, I plan to, this weekend, take the muckrack course because I think just watching how um, there have been so many interesting projects that have emerged online purely on uh, with an idea and uh, and these platforms, right? I've seen the kids do some amazing things. My daughter's uh, spearheading a diversity uh, conversation at her school. My uh, son has uh, taken uh, the science of cooking uh, class at Harvard uh, X. You know, it's just amazing to see the, the things that are going on. And I myself, uh, because of the support of uh, Sri and the kids, um, I'm halfway through writing a novel. Uh, so th this is the kind of stuff that um, the, the COVID, um, I, I, th I think of quarantine both as a, the, the, a curse, but also as a gift in a way of uh, making us introspective and pushing us to try out some new stuff. So I guess that's what uh, what it's mean, meant for me. And watching, watching the kind of work you've done is an inspiration because it's consistent, you don't let up. It's, uh, you know, the work you do with WBAI, you've taught uh, my, our son to do some very interesting programming as well. So um, lots of lots of interesting mind, um, mind expanding moments during this, during these 125 days. And one of the things that I think we also learned is the importance of teamwork for everybody. Agreed. And we certainly uh, did that. Uh, Vandana and Rose, before Rupa goes, I promise her she'd only have to be here for a few minutes. Uh, so if uh, either of you have a question or a comment to her, otherwise we'll bring on our other guests too. And Rupa, you can stay as long as uh, you have time. I know you've got to go work on that novel. <laughs> just, just two things I'll say. Rupa, thank you so much. Um, and it's amazing that you, you're halfway through a novel. <laughs> Only you could do that. I don't know. You're amazing. Uh, and uh, just a shout out to my family, um, my husband, who's been a guest. So he keeps reminding me that he, he may want to be a guest on the 137th show because he was on the 37th show, which was a children's book author night. And uh, so I have not brought this up with Sri, but here we go, public. And then uh, my kids for... You know, today they made dinner, they cleaned it up because the mom was, was working. And uh, they've just been, uh, and they're, you know, they're all pretty savvy on, on tech, so that it's been a help and uh, it's been fun. Thank and you. And didn't you, didn't you get an early birthday gift? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, yes, I got a, a new iPad. I, I think I have the oldest one. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that, that's a third screen to have with my phone and, the, you know, I'll get that set up soon. <laughs> Nice, nice. Vandana, thoughts from you? Honestly, my only question is, how have the both of you avoided 
awkward like zoom bomb type <laughs> experiences i have never seen anyone accidentally pop up or like walk by in pajamas and i think that's an amazing test when you are so very cohesive <laughs> set up <laughs> well, well i think me out I, of the house that's one way <laughs> Well there's that but when we're in the same house I think we're all four of us have been so uh, so busy I don't believe we've been this busy you know a pre quarantine so uh, I think we've all had our our various cameras in various rooms doing various conferences so which is happy to keep out of each other's way <laughs> and we could also acknowledge our dog Tara who's at the Tara on Twitter that she did her part when we were in Manhattan we're going back tomorrow she went from 3 to 4 walks a day to 2 walks a day and that's so hard for a dog to do so that was her part we'd keep whenever every time i take her out say don't don't be the reason i died today dog please and uh, she is amazing so well behaved i have never heard her bark even once <laughs> she took your place though you had her on the show uh while you were on vacation and she she was in your spot on the on the screen. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> right. right. That was that was fun when we had her on. So Rupa, we'll let you go if you have anything else you'd like to add. And congratulations. Uh you know, I I I hope I pray that this is one of the last shows, but I suspect it's not. So um keep up the amazing work. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. all right. Thank you Rupa and everyone please follow her. She's Rupa online on Twitter. and you can find her on linkedin of course and connect with her as well and thanks love see you bye 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 see you all right now we've got uh, some people who have been so patient waiting in the background we want to bring them uh, uh onto the show so they can they can say hi uh, including somebody who was on one of our first four shows and is here as well so please say hi to john lee hi john hey shri teres steiner And Renee Edelman. Hi. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> uh hi to all three of you and we'll have more people joining us uh, as the show continues. Uh so first let me ask uh each of you how are you doing? How's your family through the crisis? And John, you were our guest on episode number 4 or 5. You had yeah. you were with the Irish Business Organization and you just had to acknowledge that we we met on St. Patrick's Day because we wanted to talk about Ireland that day and uh it was it was when Ireland and other countries in Europe were much more worrisome than we were here so John if you can talk a little bit first how you're doing and then sure. talk a little bit about what the three months of or four months have been like yeah well four months ago i was sitting in this exact same spot and i have basically not moved since then tree <laughs> uh, yeah it's it's you know i i'm working from home uh, it's okay my wife is working from home my daughter is home from college uh she her semester was interrupted about uh uh march 1st and she did not go back after that and then today we just got the news that she's not going back in the fall so uh oh, sorry where is that where is uh, that uh, kenyan college oh, in ohio in ohio yeah and it's a small school it's an isolated school we were hoping it would work out that she could go back 2 weeks ago it sounded like it was going to happen and we started to feel nope this isn't going to work and they they pulled the plug on the semester for uh for her her grade uh it's going to be a uh, you know a from home exercise so huge disappointment but there's also a well now we don't have to worry so much about this health experiment that would be going on so anyway so and then uh, shri we you know we met uh right around St. Patrick's Day there and that was obviously you know we were a bit of a trip wire for the impact of covid cancellations with the parade canceled with our Irish business organizations events canceled we've pivoted to digital we've kept the membership engaged the, the members are getting hit by this hard like everybody else so um we've we've managed to do uh you know a fairly good job keeping people involved giving them good information and inspiration to keep them going during this time. Oh well, thank you uh I remember that cancellation of the parade and now the marathon has been canceled and so many other things. Uh what is what is your message uh to people who are running nonprofits and are worried about not just income but keeping that engagement going? Yeah, you know, we're we're a business networking organization and we have a lot of kind of sole practitioners, people looking for clients. 
Uh, you know, I don't want to say we were hit harder than anybody else, but this was a group that was very badly hit. Uh, their businesses, they may just be kind of out there on their own without a good support network. So people looking for a job whose job offer didn't come through, people out of work now. So our, our goal was to be as service oriented towards the membership as possible, give them in, information, inspiration, provide good speakers, networking opportunities yeah. online, which we've done through a Oh, I think maybe like eight events since we last talked, Shree. And then uh, tomorrow night, we're going to take it easy. We're going to have an online happy hour. We have some music, some comedy. We have the uh, U.S. Amb Ireland's ambassador to the U.S. going to join us and read a poem. So we're going to get a little arts and culture and some fun going and, and give ourselves a break. Irish poetry. That sounds fabulous. And an Irish party. Can anybody come? <laughs> anybody can come. It's uh, You go to uh, www ibonewyork.org. ibonewyork.org. So everyone, please check that out and you can attend from anywhere in the world. Yep. And, and you can get be a little Irish for one uh, Tuesday night, one Wednesday night. So that's awesome. We have, we have a big tent uh, view as to what, what makes you Irish. That's, that, that's fabulous. And please, everyone, please follow John Lee at John, uh, John Lee Media. And we'll come to you with a couple of questions Great. from our uh, uh, producers in just a minute. First, let's say hi to Therese. And let's also make sure Renee is uh, has her, uh, adjusts her headroom as we're all adjusting and learning. Therese, let's go to you. Uh, how are you? Where are you? How are you doing? Um, I'm in Bonjour from Yonkers, New York, which is how I always sign on to uh, the COVID show and or the Shri New York Times read along on Sunday. Um, I first have to say congratulations, Shri, to you and to the entire team, to Rose and Vonda, because sustaining this for 125 days, I come from public television. I know what it's like to put on a live show every day, and it is hard. And I am um, one of the things, the silver linings I feel that is coming out of this COVID crisis is there's a lot of innovation. And I just want to congratulate you for the continued innovation that you are bringing to all of us and how much I have learned from you and learned from all of your guests. Oh, it's just, it's been incredible. I feel like I've met so many interesting people that I feel I have a relationship with and it's only because I'm seeing them on your shows. It's, it's, it's sort of crazy, but it's wonderful. So thank you. Thank you. And we should remind everybody you were on an amazing show uh, where we talked about voting rights in the United States. And uh, we want to continue to talk about voting rights. So remind us about that show, who else was with you, and why it was important that we, you, we, you come on the show at that day. Well, first of all, thank you again for the opportunity. I am, you asked sort of how I'm doing during this COVID crisis. And I should say all my, both my kids are in California. So of course I miss them and their significant others tremendously and my granddaughter. But what has kept me rooted is my work in issues relating to voters' rights and voter suppression and my nonprofit work. So I'm on the board of a couple of organizations, but I'll talk about one, Justice Aid. And Justice Aid sort of fights injustice through the arts and sort of recognizes warriors and civil rights organizations around the theme. Our theme this year is voter suppression and our incredible beneficiary is election protection of the Lawyers Committee for civil rights under law that fights voter suppression on the local level all across the country. And they're just phenomenal. Um, we put on concerts to raise money for our beneficiary and we also raise awareness for the issues. And so we came on your show and oh my goodness, we followed um, Sapphire, <laughs> which was who wrote the, the, who wrote the book that, that made became precious. So it was like, oh my goodness, what a lead, what an incredible lead in. Um, was on with, with Steve Millikent with a, a woman on our board named Brand, um, Brand um, I'm sorry, uh, Hardy Brandon, who's just incredible. And we talked a lot about voting rights and what was going on, sort of it was actually pre, right around George Floyd, but a little bit pre George Floyd, and how important voting rights are in this country and how important it is for absolutely everyone to have a plan and get out to vote and how there's a lot of efforts to suppress people's opportunity to be able to do that. So thank you. And that was such an important show. Yeah. And, uh, we're gonna come to you also with a question, but let's say hello to Renee Edelman. Hi, Renee. 
Uh, Hi, I'm so happy to be here tonight and congratulate all of you on 125 days. I'm in awe. Oh, thank you. That's very sweet. Uh, Renee is an amazing public relations and communications and strategic communications uh, expert. And you were so supportive of the show from day one. And you asked a lot of different people to be guests and to support us in other ways. And you also brought us Tanya Reese. Tell us about the work that she's doing. Well, Edelman does um, hosts does research called the Trust Barometer, the Edelman Trust Barometer, and we, I owe you the most recent one um, about brands that trust has become the second um, factor of people or criteria that people are using about whether they'll buy a brand, and that is whether they are doing the right thing on public issues, you know, whether their CEO is speaking out on issues against racism and, you know, having diversity in their boardroom and in the, on their staff. So, and also doing something to improve society. Um, and we're excited about that. And um, trust has been a key issue um, today in whether people trust you know, the government and whether they trust the news and whether they trust the agencies like the CDC or the WHO. It's been a big uh, issue. Sure. And I, I want to tell everybody that if you go back and watch, you can find our entire 125 episode archive on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash net. Uh, please check it out. There you'll find our conversation with Tanya Reese. She said something that I've been quoting almost every day to all our clients and telling mm -hmm. them, that, and that line was, in the pandemic, people want to hear from brands, but they want solutions, not sales. Solutions, That's right. not sales. And I say that to our team as well. Solutions, not sales. So That's thank the you. Same. That's still true. And I'm really excited to share with you this most recent report because we have a lot of new findings. Um, and so maybe Tonya and Richard or someone will come on. Yeah, so that would be, be great. I've been really sustained by this show. I'm very grateful to all of you. You all look so fresh and energized by your work. And so it, it seems to be working and, you know, we have to live every day, but my hope is that we'll find a way to, you'll find a way to continue this and make it a real business no. as part of your business, DigiMentors, okay. because you have such a loyal community and we've all learned so much. And, you know, we miss it when we're not, <laughs> tuned in. Thank so you. thank you for everything. I'm touched to be part of it. Thank you. And um, I want to um, uh, make sure that Vandana and Rose get to ask John and the three of you a question, but I do want to say hello to someone who is off stage and will be joining us. Mark Lee is here. He was on one of our shows and it was terrific. So before we go to questions, let's just welcome and say hi on our global tour. These are what our favorite parts of this. And there's Jonathan Borstein. He's watched for 125 straight days. He was on our 100th show. And he's in the East Village, which still has some sleaze and seediness left as if the early reports of a murder are accurate. So there was some kind of murder apparently found. A body was found uh, today. So we don't know what that's about. Uh, Rehajan, who has been a, a guest on the show, he worked with the New York Times for 20 years, now is in the care, uh, the healthcare industry. Congrats on your 125th show from Center Reach, Long Island. Won't be able to st stay long, but we'll catch the replay. Thank you. Our friend Roberta's watching from Richmond. By the way, anyone wants to react to any of these people or places, please jump in. Mahesh is watching. Hi, Mahesh. Roberta says, your show has brought so much wisdom and important voices during this crisis. Thank you. And, and uh, Roberta, who's a former uh, CBS uh, producer and colleague of mine, uh, she has gone on to really take this virtual events uh, like we're doing in shows and just does such a great job. Uh, uh, we're, we're so proud of her. Uh, Ashok is watching from Kerala in India. Have, has anyone except Vandana been to Kerala in India here? Not me. No, okay, so we've got to do a trip to India, all of us uh, <laughs> together. That would be, that'd be fun. Perry says, impressed, I'm awake for this. Thanks for all you're doing to bring people together in this difficult time. Perry is my uh, CDO mentor, chief digital officer mentor, and she's just fabulous. Uh, and uh, Roberta says, are you gonna take a break? It's great to see you on Spire Island. Yes, I. my family's taking a break as much as they can, and I am uh, continuing to work, not just on this, but we've built a virtual events business, 
in the middle of this pandemic. And we're so grateful to everyone who supported us. One more introduction, and then we will uh, go to Rose to ask John a question. Uh, Paula is wa watching from Tallahassee, Florida. Paula is on our team that produces uh, all of these events, uh, as well as these shows. And she's also part of the New York Times Read Along family. And the New York Times Read Along is our show that uh, runs every Sunday, 8.30 to 10 a.m. Eastern. This past Sunday, you can find in our archives our show with Mary Curtis, who is a former New York Times editor. And she was so fabulous. I learned so much. Hope all of you will tune in to the recording. And then this coming Sunday, 8.30 a.m. Eastern, we have Claire Smith here. And Claire is the first woman inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame's writer's wing and a former New York Times baseball columnist. And she's hosted by my guest host and executive producer, Neil Parikh, who is going, who was a big Yankees fan and big baseball nut. And so he's going to be guest hosting this. I'm delighted uh, that, that we can make that happen. Part of the reason he's hosting is that I was supposed to be leaving for Puerto Rico on Sunday uh, in the old days. And uh, well, that's why we schedule that. But uh, obviously, the world has changed so much. And we'll talk more about that changing world in a bit. But Vandana uh, and Rose have a question for John. Go ahead. Hi, John. Hi. Hey. Uh, I've met you at, at absolutely at Rose. Event, so it's really great to see you here. Uh, and I guess I'll ask you, ask you, what are the three things that have been you've learned most as you've pivoted to online or the IBO? Sure. Um, well, I think on a practical level, our events have been free, so we get uh, vastly more signups than show ups. Uh, you know, for a, an event, a live event where where we have 60 RSVPs, we might get 75 people to come. Another event where we'd have 75 people sign up on uh, online, maybe we'll get 50 people to show up. It's much easier to kind of say, yeah, I might want to do that if it comes my way. So that's one thing. Um, the other one is the people who uh, resisted the idea of breakout rooms. I, we've been using the Zoom platform, not as sophisticated as what uh, Shri and team are doing here, Rose, but uh, people have really like said, you know what, I, when you said breakout rooms, I cringed, but uh, actually I really got a lot out of it. Uh, one one room, I got a lot of it professionally, and the other room, we just had a lot of great conversation and good stories and got to meet people. Um, and then I found that uh, we've been fairly successful with pulling things together rather late in the day. <laughs> Because, you know, we were kind of jumping in on this uh, process without no, personally without knowing what we were doing. And uh, there, there was definitely an appetite out there. And uh, without a lot of advanced publicity, we were able to get uh, good people together. And we saw the advantage of we can bring people in from all over the world now. So we've had people from, from Ireland speaking live. We've had people from New Zealand speaking live. So very, very interesting uh, new opportunities. It was there all the time. Why didn't we use it before? And do you think you're going to keep keep doing uh, online events even after you're able to do more? In I, I think we will. In a, in a way, it kind of shakes up the IBO. We, we've been a little bit set on a certain pattern of events, which is good for the members. They sort of know where to be and when to be there, you know, what to expect. But this, this opens up some really nice new opportunities. I think... Uh, uh, we might do some career groups that just kind of meet independently and talk about career issues and uh, just you know, really provide a forum for the members. One, one of the things that I've noticed that you've done is uh, on your when you send out the announcement for the next networking group, which I think you have to, tomorrow, you have, a, yep. well, yeah, you have this uh, music and poetry and not, po yeah, poetry. Yeah, poetry. And, and dancing, um, that you have a, a link, you know, you have um, sort of, classified ads, you know, for your, for your memory. Right. Is yeah, that was, that was, that was a new one. We have like offers and asks yeah. and initially the members weren't, weren't really responding, but after they saw a few other people get their offer or ask in, let's say a, a member's offering a discount to other members for their products or um, someone's offering online Irish dance classes, uh, th that type of thing. So yeah, you're right, Rose. It's sort of like a classified ad section. That's yeah. a member a member benefit. It's very cool, and I noticed that you had two two people offering Irish dancing. You're right. <laughs> I have to have to have to keep them separate, but I think they're good friends. So, uh, just showed up on the screen, folks. Uh, and before Vandana asks 
Therese a question. Uh, this was our episode on March 18th. So uh, this is episode number four. Uh, wow. And uh, what was life like in Europe under coronavirus? So we talked to, uh, as you can see, uh, John uh, in New York, but you know, so connected into Ireland. We had our friend Zach in the Czech Republic. And you can see the Italian flag there with our friend Clara uh, talking about life in Italy. And in that moment, John, you remember, we thought those countries were the basket cases. And we were, you know, we were worried, but not so worried. And then we became the basket case. Like, you know, that old palm olive line, like, where's the basket case? You're soaking in it. You know, that <laughs> yeah, was right. what it felt like. I mean, obviously, I'm joking a little bit, but the tragedy of all of this is that we were not prepared as a country. And then once it came here, we were not prepared to execute the prevention. Um, any thoughts on that before we move on? Yeah, sure. I look so so young and innocent in that picture. It's <laughs> a bit cruel. Uh, one thing that personally we we watch this thing arrive. My wife is from Northern Italy, so she her, her family is from the epicenter, uh, the first real big epicenter outside of Hunan, I, I would say. And so we we watched this thing. We, we were watching it for a while, and we were getting nervous for a while. So we've been very very cautious as a result. Wow. All right, Vandana, over to you. Hi. Hey, Vandana. I think, I think my... Yeah, it's working. Go ahead. You're, okay. you're... Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, yeah. So what has been the most innovative... Um, have, you ever come, have you come across like a creative issue over the last few months and what's been the most innovative thing for you to overcome it? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, like everyone else in the world, I'm working on a podcast. And uh, I have a partner and we were, we, we were having lunch one day. And we, we both started talking about this podcast idea that we had that were so similar, but not quite the same. Uh, and we said, you know, I said, I'm having trouble getting out of first gear on this thing. He had some issues that he didn't quite understand. So we decided to, uh, to pool our very similar ideas. I think there's a little creative tension in there to keep it on track. And I think the biggest sort of creative lesson for me is being collaborative. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it's time to say, you know what, I think this idea is better. And when it's time to say, you know what, that's good. Let's, let's try it your way. That's fine too. So I think this has been a real education. We, we recorded our introduction last week and we're trying to get our first guest next week and the theme guess what is irish uh it's called irish stew and it's the audience is the global irish nation the diaspora and the people on ireland kind of open up an audio channel between the, the different irish types of people around the world one last question seamus heaney or wb yates Oh, gee, that's a tough one. Yeah, probably uh, I had a job uh, in horse racing at one time and on Saint, I was on TV before the races began. And I always on St. Patrick's Day, I always read the WB Yates poem about the Galway races. So I've got kind of a, uh, a soft spot for him. But everything I've seen and read from Heaney is, is really impressive. And uh, it's an area I need to know more about. Yeah. Is it is it okay for the president of the IBO to make those kinds of uh, we, preferences? We like, we like poetry on the show, or I like poetry. Yeah, right. you know, one thing I find in an Irish business event, it is not at all surprising to have a CEO get up there and spout poetry. Uh, it's not surprising that they have an Irish musician as part of the event. The arts are not; it's it's very integral in, in, integral to to their to, to their mindset. And I've also found in the speakers we've had for the IBO, some of the best business lessons have come from people in the, let's say the creative industries, people who have figured out if I'm going to be, do this creative work, I have to make a business out of it. I have to make it work. And they have really, really been interesting how they figured out how to make the whole thing work for them. And a lot, a lot of great business lessons as a result. That's great. We should say that you were kind enough to have me be a speaker at one of your events. So you really are the biggest possible tent at the Irish Business Organization. We'll get you back too. Thank you. And we'll let you go so you can get back to your evening. Thank okay, you so much, John Lee. Follow him. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Appreciate it. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, John. Okay. Uh, Rose, a question for Therese. And we're going to bring in, while you're doing that, we're going to bring in our friend, Mark Lee. We, we can only have one Lee on this show at the time. So <laughs> here's Mark Lee. Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? Hi. 
Uh, Mark is watching from Durham, North Carolina. We'll come to him, but uh, Rose, over to you and Therese. Okay. Uh, Therese, Hi. I think you, you mentioned something to me. You have a big event. I mean, we had your the, the event at Riverside Church. That yes, incredible. Incredible. Uh, and so many great people that spoke, the Reverend from the church. Uh, yeah, and, Reverend Livingston spoke, and we had yeah. Stacey Abrams and Hakeem Jeffries, and Sri was fantastic. Sri was a, a, an honorary host for this event on voting and voter suppression that we, just to say, did it in partnership with Riverside Church in New York. And we, you know, just to say, you were asking before about transitioning to online. So just, all of our events are always in person. And so all of a sudden we had to quickly pivot and do our concert online and do our big forum online. And now of course, everything's online. And I just wanna say, Renee, I mentioned that I'm on several boards. One of them is Classic Stage Company. And I had the great privilege that Matt Harrington, your global president of Edelman was on the board, learned so much from him. And now Justin Blake, another Edelman guru is on the board. So. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you so much. They love being on the board. Yeah, it's so great. Okay, so Rose, about our coming events. So um, just to say, uh, you know, I mentioned our theme is voting and voter suppression, which is a very big deal this year. And one of the things we're very hyped about is how we can help engage youth in our society to get out there and register to vote and vote. Um, there are like 44 million youth in America that are eligible to vote, people 18 to 49, 15 million of those are have just turned 18. And something we learned from Maria Teresa Kumar at the Forum at Riverside Church is in Texas alone, there are 3.5 unregistered Latinx youth. So mm -hmm. it's a real, I think youth really do have the power to impact the results of this election. It's making them feel that the issues are important to them, that their voice matters, the issues are important that they care about. I think everything that's going on in this country post George Floyd, we're hoping to get a lot of submissions to our first Justice Aid Film Forum that we're doing in partnership with Civic Life Project and their Democracy 2020 Youth Film Challenge that they founded several years ago they founded the Civic Life Project to find a way to engage youth in civics and in their society and introduce it better to them by making documentaries. And this year, the film challenge is gonna focus on filmmaking. Um, we're looking for films on, on a variety of issues. The Justice Aid Prize, of course, is geared towards issues that are related specifically to racism, police brutality, injustice, voter suppression, and immigration rights, anything that has to do with a justice issue, any entry qualifies to be a candidate for the Justice Aid Prize, and any submission also qualifies to be a candidate for the Civic Life Project Prizes. We're doing two categories. One is short films and the other is social media. And I'm pleased to say that Sri is one of the judges on our social media. And I'm also pleased to say that Shri and the Digimenters will be producing our event, our Justice Aid event, our film forum, which will be on September 17th on StreamYard, produced by yours truly, and the Civic Life Project event, they're gonna have a film festival as well that's gonna, we're looking at it's a double feature and that's gonna be on September 10th. So please encourage, I hope you can post, we post some links, please encourage every, person you know 15 to 25 to submit a film. Kids are home in the summer. They have a lot of things on their minds. We want to hear what they are and we want to know what matters to them and their communities in this upcoming election. That's terrific, Therese. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, I, uh, I know that Vandana has a question for Renee after this. Go ahead. Hi, Renee. Hi. What have you been doing to keep positive over the last few months? Because whenever I see you, you're always so happy and smiley and just so oh, nice. Thank you. I've spent time trying to mentor young people because it's very difficult for them to come out of college and not have internships ready. So I'm working with a young friend to promote a book of a friend of mine who wrote a book called 
my trans parent, and um, he's helping me with that because he's done a lot of work with LGBT causes. And, um, you know, I'm trying to talk with people by phone about their job opportunities. I just got a text from somebody who was, you know, looking, thinking she wanted to do communications and she moved with her fiance to Atlanta where they both have family and she's getting a job as a assistant teacher in a Montessori school because she said at Columbia, she was worked in the babysitting service for four years and that's really her passion. So that inspired me because that didn't take a long time and if it's the right fit, I think it'll work. So that's how I'm spending my time. That's, that's, that's what great. Go ahead, Vandana, you have another? Yeah, I actually had another question for Therese, actually. I know that this is a really difficult time for artists and performances in general. What future do you see coming out of this um, for, for holding performances? I think, oh, God, it is so, I really feel for all the incredible artists out there, whether you're a musician, a painter, an actor, a performer of any kind, this is really, really hard. But I do feel that something that has gotten a lot of people through this crisis is the arts. Mm -hmm. And you look at everything that's available online now that you could never have had before. There, from the Metropolitan Opera, the Metropolitan Museum, small theater companies, people, I mean, a classic stage company, our artistic director, John Doyle, is doing interviews with individuals who were the cast of Assassins, which is our next production that, of course, has been delayed. People are innovating. And I am very, very hopeful that a lot, and I feel strongly that there are a lot of artists who are performing online and exposing what they do online to an audience, a global audience that never would have had the opportunity to meet them before, mm -hmm. no matter where they are in the world and sharing that. And I think my, once again, this is one of my silver lining to COVID dreams is that the arts are going to be even more valued as so important to the soul of humanity because it's, arts are going to be getting a lot of people, as I mentioned, actually through this crisis. And I just want to shout out to every artist and performer out there for the work that you do. You are valued. Keep doing it and keep innovating. Keep creating. Um, Sari, I wanted to ask you to tell us all what it is you say, learn something, do something, read something. I just wanted to get that quote so I can share that with people. Well, we say on our newsletter, which I hope everybody will subscribe to, which is srinet.substack.com, uh, you see it on the screen. And for this pandemic, we said, uh, you know, always be learning, but we also said work on something. And it doesn't have to be you know, uh, anything grand. Many of us just worked on our sourdough bread baking skills. I'm still trying to figure mm -hmm. out why sourdough. I love sourdough, but why so much sourdough? And, uh, but other people did, you know, more ambitious things. Look at Rose and Vandana, what they have accomplished during this pandemic, which is incredible. And, uh, but you don't have to have done something huge to have had a successful pandemic. The most important thing you can do is survive the pandemic. And we are not through this. And that's what makes me so upset. We have one of our doctor friends, Marina Korean, will be joining us in a minute, and she'll be talking about the medical situation because it is so atrocious. And um, you're getting me thinking about that. So, but I, while we have these positive people here, especially Therese and Renee, we just want to thank them both for being here, for being such great supporters of all our work, and we look forward to seeing you both soon in the comments as well as coming back on the air and uh, and talking to us. And Renee, I know you're going to bring us another great episode, which will have guests from Edelman. Yes, we will. And thank you all so much. I thank your audience, too, for listening and supporting, being part of this uh, dynamic community. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Be well. So, Marie, can thank I, you. Please go ahead, John. I just wanted to ask Therese, um, how yeah. do filmmakers get involved in this uh, film thing that you're doing? Because I'm here in North Carolina. We have a rich filmmaking community here and a lot of filmmakers that are doing great things. So I would love to know how they can get involved because I have to agree with Renee. The arts has been playing a significant role in what is going on. I have several of my friends that are artists, filmmakers, and things of that nature. And they are definitely doing some great work. They are doing things, as you said, um, I believe that was Renee that said it, 
on the, uh, or it might be in Uteris, on the social media kind of platform and things of that nature. So they've definitely been getting out there. So I would just like to know how some of my filmmaking friends can also get involved with what y'all are doing. Oh, that's great. Um, if they are 15 to 25, please have them submit. It's so, you know, we've waived all of the submission fees uh, due to COVID. So submit a film uh, and, uh, or, and or a social media piece. You can go to justiceaid.org and look for the film challenge or civiclifeproject.org as well and sign up. It's great. Um, if you you can just uh, DM me on Twitter if you have other questions about how filmmakers we can help filmmakers just let me know. I will definitely do that because, like I said, uh, I know that there were several people that would be very in um, wanting to do that. Um, I was involved actually, as Shri knows, on a uh, festival. It was a festival that was actually taking place usually on the outside. It was an outside festival, the festival that you know which celebrates nature and folk music and blues and a lot of the roots music, but uh, they couldn't do it in out in the big field because they wanted to do social distancing and things of that nature. So we actually did it as an online event. And that was about two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago. And it was a tremendous success. So a friend, Greg Bell did one, you know, and uh, they did some great uh, kind of getting out there. They did some innovative things like they had an auction and some other things that they don't always do, but it was a tremendous success. I actually got to get some of my auction items from him very shortly. So it definitely was great. I did actually, we got to do some pre-recording because that's something that Sri doesn't do. He doesn't do that much pre-recording. He does mostly right here on the spot. And I'm always impressed when he does that, but they did some pre-recording. So the pre-recording part, I emceed. And then we had somebody that was doing more of the live part, which was Joe Newberry, a very well-known folk musician around the world. And he actually did the live part on the actual day that the uh, festival took place. But I did the pre-recording and I had a chance to interview uh, Dude's like the introduction of about uh, three uh, musicians or three musical groups. And that was real fun that I had a chance to do and everything. Um, I've just got to like, give out this other thing and then maybe I'll like, uh, turn it back over to Vandana and Rose, who are just great people. I just love y'all, by the way. I've adopted y'all as like part of my family and things of that nature. So I definitely just enjoy all of the team here that exists. And I consider, as uh, Shri, I just have to let you know, everybody that I've met here, I've just really developed a great friendship with. Me and Stefan are always in contact. I'm talking to Tim on a regular basis. So I made some really great friends. Unfortunately, because of the uh, crisis that we're in, I haven't had a chance to meet any of these people, but I think we have a rich friendship and I'm looking forward to meeting them in person. I know that your producer of the Sunday Read Along is a big time sports fan. You don't know this about me because I don't always reveal it. But I am a big time sports fan as well. It usually follows baseball with the Durham Bulls, football. Um, I root for the Minnesota Vikings and my Carolina Panthers and things of that nature. But I'm also a big college basketball fan and oftentimes root for my Golden Eagles, the Marquette team. So if you had caught me about a few minutes ago, you would have heard me screaming at the TV because <laughs> TBT put together a tournament and the Golden Eagles won the million dollars. They've come oh, wow. up short the last year, so they won the million dollars this year. Last year, they were the runner-ups because it's a winner-take-all. You either win it all or you don't win anything. So um, actually, a gentleman from Raleigh, Jerry Johnson Odom, who I've met a couple of times, was the um, uh, most valuable player. because He actually won the most valuable player awards. I'm hoping that I'm going to get him on my podcast and have a conversation with them about what that experience was like. Cause they literally had to get, I forget how many teams it was, but it was maybe 28 or so teams in a bubble. So they did it in uh, Columbus, Ohio, and they had to do all the tests and they had to do all of that. And they just had tremendous amount of success. I think in the last two rounds, they had zero cases of any sort of COVID. So they were able to pull off this amazing tournament. And like I said, you would have heard me doing like screams and yells and actually, you know, as usual, I'm, got my dress uh, shirt on like I would do on the StreamYard show that I do on Monday evenings and things of that nature, but uh, on Monday afternoons. But today, I've uh, underneath it is a Marquette shirt. So like you got your art show, I got my Marquette <laughs> shirt underneath here. <laughs> nice. Uh, I want to let Therese and Renee go so that we can bring on our Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. This is okay. an honor right. on your sh this show. I, Thank you. I have uh, three, three sons. All of them have won various video um, award contests. Uh, there was a, a statewide, a statewide one, and um, my two, my twins won for 
best documentary, which they did about a cybersecurity case. Uh, and they it, have to submit. Oh my yeah. God, the media. Well, I have to tell them, but but I can uh, help you promote that because I'm also do a, a Twitter for an educational uh, organization. So uh, it's very exciting. It's great that you're doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Therese, and good luck with everything. We'll see you soon, okay? Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye, bye Renee. And uh, we are now uh, joined by our doc, one of our doctor friends, Marina Corinne. has been waiting very patiently. Let's say hello to her. Hi, Marina. Hey, how are you guys? Hi. Hi. We want to talk to you about the medical aspects of all of this. Marina is a fabulous surgeon in New York. She's also the president of the New York State Chapter of the American College of Surgeons. And she's the host of a brand new show on uh, on the inter interwebs, as we call it. And uh, she is the executive producer along with me and our friend, Dr. Sujana Korean. And these uh, two ladies you see here are also producers of that show. And it's called She's On Call. And uh, Marina, why don't you talk about it? And then we will show the uh, a quick ad uh, of that as well. And also give our team a chance to just relax for a minute and take a deep breath. We've been going straight for 56 minutes. So go ahead, Marina. So um, the show is She's On Call, and I'm on Marina Korean with Sujana Chandrasekhar, Dr. S uh, Dr. Sujana. And um, we decided to, along with Sri, actually, I think it was, this might have been his like little brain child, that we should do a show talking about medicine, because we certainly both have spent quite a bit of time not just doing webinars for our different societies, but also talking to Sri on, on his multiple shows. and providing um, some insight and uh, knowledge to his fan base as well as to our society. So we decided to launch the show. We just had one uh, with some great guests. So this was our show number five, but number six is coming up and it's on Sundays from 11 to 12. And I hope that everybody tunes in. You can find it on YouTube and on Facebook at She's On Call uh, and um, Rose is uh, directly responsible for our Twitter presence. So, you know, you can check that at who's on call as well. Uh, and uh, Instagram, we have some stuff too, but we're not live on Insta. And But but I think tune in because our next guests are going to be Dr. Wendy Sinta, who is um, the past president of the Obesity Medicine Association. And the other guest is Dr. Tamara Fountain, who is the president-elect of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. And so Sujana is a past president of the um, Otorhinolaryngologic Association, uh, head of neck surgery, and I'm the current president of the New York State chapter of the ACS. So we had this cute idea that we we're just gonna call it the president show. So number six <laughs> is the president show. So, uh, but it'll be fun. We're gonna be talking to them about um, obesity and some of the comorbid conditions, as well as all the eye issues that have come up and things that are uh, important currently things that people may have been ignoring that they shouldn't. So we have some great guests on to discuss all of that. And uh, just to clarify, you know, your your show is meant to be for everybody, even though you, you, you have four doctors talking to each other. Let's just show the picture of, of the show that's coming up. Tell us again about these doctors. So Dr. Wendy Sinta is the past president of the Obesity Medicine Association. She has this great uh, program that she developed in upstate New York called Bounce. She's in Syracuse. Uh, which is something for childhood obesity. Dr. Tamara Fountain is an ophthalmologist whose specialist, specialty, specialty is oculoplastic surgery, and she's the uh, president-elect of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. So, um, but, you know, it's a show on leadership. It's a show on uh, medicine. It's, it's really our takes, and I think uh, Sujin and I do a really great job of trying to explain medical stuff to our patients and our colleagues and our friends. And so this is kind of why we decided to take the show on the air, if you will, into the internet instead of the show on the road. But so um, <laughs> then our guests are, are people that are like-minded that can also get that message across. That's awesome. We want to make sure that uh, Mark uh, and, and all of us get to talk. And if anyone has a medical question for the doctor, there's a good chance to ask as well. You don't have to wait till Sunday to ask the question I have for you, Marina, is how do you explain how we're in this terrible, awful situation in America? We're still leading the world in, in deaths. We're leading the world in new cases. We're, we're the best country for healthcare, we were told all these years. Uh, tell us where we are. We had a situation where we were shortage of PPEs 
and we're heading back that way again. So please talk a little bit. And then if Mark has a question, he'll jump in and Vandana and Rose as well. But Marina, go ahead. So a few things, I mean, you know, certainly in the New York area, we have really locked down on the coronavirus and it came really from our, uh, our governor and the mayors really uh, insisting that everybody wear face covering when they're out. If you're sick, stay home, practice social distancing. We also all really quarantined for several weeks um, without any, um, you know, except to go out for, for necessities like shopping. And, and plenty of people that I know that were quarantined during that time really had their groceries delivered, wiped them down, et cetera. So I think that we really were very serious about it, especially since our numbers were so tremendously high. Unfortunately, Florida, I think it's today had the, today or yesterday had the dubious honor of being the state with the highest positive COVID patients. And there are a couple of things that are going on right now. One, we're seeing that there may be less deaths at this time than when we first got it. And we were the epicenter for the entire country in the New York area. Uh, and we're, that's something that they're looking at as to why, uh, whether it's better treatment, not using certain things um, uh, that were part of the treatment regimen, uh, whether the, the virus is actually mutated. Unfortunately, we don't have any clear cut answers. What is interesting is the CDC just two hours ago um, posted two studies. One was a Boston uh, area hospital that had mandated um, masks and made some changes to how they were treating COVID. And they were able to show with data, and it is a case series, but they were able to show that wearing the mask significantly decreased their transmission of COVID uh, in, within the hospital system. And then the other thing that they looked at was uh, another case series. But you guys remember when the two um, hairstylists were in, in, in Missouri at a, at a salon and they treated a, a certain number of, pay, of clients, but they were both positive. Well, they both were wearing masks and all the contact tracing was done and none of the clients actually developed um, COVID as, a, as it related to their time within the salon. So wearing masks is helpful. And then finally, the CDC just, um, CDC and the, the White House uh, COVID task force just suggested that everyone, every American when they leave their home should be wearing a cloth mask. And then they did a quick internet poll and or survey and it said that, that um, three out of four Americans would be more likely to wear a mask. On. And I think that's part of it. We didn't have a clear, consistent message. There wasn't a clear, consistent pattern to, to what should be done. The governor should have all probably gotten together and had the same plan and the same strategy that wasn't done. Unfortunately, that's why we're seeing surges in Arizona and Texas and in uh, Florida and California. Plus, people are not doing social distancing. There's a great picture um, of uh, one of the parks in Brooklyn where there are these circles drawn on the ground and people are within the circles and the circles are six feet apart. And you could be with three or four people in your circle, but you're still in your circle. And I thought that was a beautiful example of social distancing and not, you know, encroaching and not being crowded. Like, you know, we saw those images of the parties that were happening in the Lake of the Ozarks and you see how crowded the beaches are. There's a way to enjoy the great outdoors without it impinging on other people's uh, health. Without impinging on freedom. I'm all for yeah. freedom. Mark, before we come yeah. to you, hold on one second. Vandana, unfortunately, has a deadline and she has to go. So she's going to ask a question. No, no, and no. then uh, you, you're you going to stay and ask uh, Marina a question. Please go ahead. No problem. I have a question for Marina and Mark, actually. Marina, this might be a very basic question, but is there a difference between a cloth mask and the kind of, and like the the plastic mask, or not the the other mask that we get at pharmacies? Like, is there a difference in efficacy? There is. Um, okay. And you know, I the, the N95 is really the gold standard for treating, it's like doctors and nurses and healthcare providers need those when they're treating someone who has active COVID. And that is going to give us the best protection. There's actually something called an N100, but it's much uh, more of like a real true uh, mask rather than just one that you have two straps on. And, um, you know, the N95 is, is really good. But if you don't know how to wear it and if you haven't been fitted for it, so you have to actually go through a fit test for an N95 to make sure that it is going to protect you. So if you just buy one and it's the wrong one and they make a lot of different types of N95, 
that have different uh, shapes and, and forms, and you see them all when we're walking around. There's also an N95 that has a valve so you can breathe out, which isn't really what you want. You want the N95 that sort of filters everything and keeps um, keeps you protected, and at the same time, it can protect other people from you. But not everyone needs that. You can wear a cloth mask. I have these bandana masks that I have. You know, there are a lot of different things you can use that if you're not, if you're asymptomatic, but you're just out and about, you're wearing, you're protecting other people from you. Um, yeah. If you're sick, you really shouldn't be out. That's all. Yeah. Does that sound so, I was sort of like mean about it. Don't be out. <laughs> you're sick. Stay home. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I was just asking because we, I've been, I was wondering if there's a more sustainable way for me to be using my mask because I've been gone through quite a few packets. Um, yeah, you, can, you can get a bandana mask. Um, mm -hmm. I actually ordered some from Amazon that were those wicking away. So they're really like more like of a turtle, but they're made of that wicking away material mm -hmm. and you just pull it up and, and it stays on and you can use that. Yeah, we ordered cloth masks with made out of and nice fabrics of course well, old navy had like a big uh, run on the you could pre-order these masks that were great they were cute designs and all this stuff and you know in our house I was, it was my daughter's so i said please can you do this and she was like sure and then by the time she got around to it sold out can't even mm. get it you know? so mm. they make, i think a lot of places are going to make them that are uh, uh, affordable and still more attractive than the 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 blue or the you know N95 that, that we have. Yeah, we went from having a shortage to at least having masks now. Um, Mark, I have I know you I know you run a podcast. How has that experience been during um, lockdown? Has it been any different? Um, have have I don't know? Are there certain takeaways that you're going to implement from now on? Um, it's actually been quite uh, interesting during the uh, whole lockdown time because it's actually opened up a lot of guests. Like I said, I found a number of guests through uh, y'all's COVID shows and things of that nature. But I've also just reached out to people like on Twitter and other things. And as one of my uh, guests said, it's not like I'm doing anything else. So, of course, I'll jump on the show because it's actually they are wanting to put out their product, wanting to put out their message, wanting to do various other things. So that's actually, I found that most people are very open to doing it and open to being guests. And um, like I'm actually doing two podcasts now. There's the one that most of y'all know me for, which is the Straight Talk with Dean and Mark, which I do in the evenings. But then on the afternoon, because of this wonderful thing called uh, StreamYard, I've actually started doing one on a, another platform called IBM.TV, and that's on that same day. So Mondays, which was yesterday, are usually very busy because I'm usually doing and producing two podcasts on that day so definitely it uh, keeps me very busy and uh i've had a great time reaching out to guests like i said some of them have been guests that have appeared on y'all show before but then i've also reached out to part of my circle but just folks also that i meet online and things of that nature so definitely it's been a uh i think a much easier process and i'm hoping to continue that process even after we get out of this craziness that we're in the middle of and i'm hoping that that will not be another 125 shows from now hopefully there'll be some things that have been before that um and the question i had for uh dr curry real quickly is uh and it's actually an observation and then also a quick question sorry so one tell, second, mark, mark sorry uh, i need to let vandana go because she has a deadline so she's going to step yeah. off dr korean is going to stay and with the four of us will chat vandana no Bye. for 125 you, days i'm so grateful to you uh as i know roses for your friendship your hard work your insights and your ability to just get stuff done. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure learning from everyone and meeting everyone. It's been great. Okay, bye bye. Okay, bye, bye. All and right. Tree, please don't, Tree, please don't tell your dog this, but I do love all animals. So I was noticing that uh, Dr. Curry was having a cameo appearance by one of her animals as well. I was noticing that the cat was appearing in there, and I have owned a couple of cats. Well, actually, cats own you. You don't really own cats, so cats own you. So I did notice that the cat was making a couple of cameo appearances, and I'm a fan of cats, so I was actually enjoying <laughs> the cat in the background, and I'm actually me and one of my apartment neighbors have adopted a rabbit because we found a she's actually growing a garden and the rabbit just kind of like popped into the neighborhood so we've kind of adopted this uh rabbit is kind of our you might as well call it the uh complex the apartment complex uh pet because he doesn't seem to be he or she doesn't seem to be arguing with uh getting fed 
but I did notice that. But my question for you was this. Um, I've noticed that a lot of folks, and we're actually staying in stage two. I'm here in North Carolina, and we're staying in stage two. Our governor decided that he did not want to move to the next stage because he's seeing numbers that he's concerned about, as well as uh, our health experts are seeing numbers that they're concerned about. But the schools are going to be open. And I know a lot of folks are talking about mixed schools being a combination of online and um, doing the remote version and also online. So I was just wondering, from a medical standpoint, what are you thinking about these efforts? Because I know that that's going on a, a lot around the country, that there's going to be this mixed kind of concept of being both online and offline to try to curtail whatever's going on with the crisis that we're in the middle of. But I have two uh, nephews. I'm not sure how I feel about them going to school when we're in the middle of a pandemic, but I know that they're... Uh, mother and my uh, brother, their dad, uh, along with other family members will eventually make that hard decision and everything as to whether they want to follow those rules. And I've heard that a couple of schools are even doing whole virtual uh, schools. I think Wake County is offering like a whole virtual thing that you can, you can go to this virtual high school and it's going to be separate from the other high schools. And I think I read something like 14% have already signed up for that and they're thinking it could get up as high as maybe even 25%. But I just wondered what some of your thoughts were about school reopening since August is just around the corner and that's when a lot of schools are going to be coming back. No one knows. I don't think anybody has any idea what's going to happen. Um, I think that if we can tamp out some of the virus uh, spread right now, that that will definitely change the trajectory of what we can expect from the for the kids, for the teachers, and for the other staff that are uh, at the schools, um, because that's really going to affect. If, if we still have a high rate of transmission, as many of the states do, um, then and you're going to school, then you have to consider what measures you're going to do. Now, I'm not an expert on that, but I just read something today that said that perhaps the kids in school should all be wearing masks, and that's in a way protecting them from each other, but also protecting the faculty and the, um, the people that work at the um, at the uh, at the school. Um, give me one second. My automated light didn't sense enough movement. This is a problem of uh, technology. But I like how still you were, which is good for what you're doing. Look at that, and let there be light. I love let it. Light. I had to look down at my phone to get it up. I'm sorry about that. So I don't think anyone has the answer. I think that we should practice caution. I know that my kids are planning on uh, attending their college. See, there we go again. Hold on one second, sorry. So they're planning on um, attending uh, in the fall and their schools, their colleges are gonna be open. Um, there's some talk that they're gonna do some of the kids for part of the semester and some of the kids for the rest of the year. Those are different strategies that people are talking about. Um, as well as, you know, in New York City, we're looking at schools being blended where they're going to do three days in class and two days online. Uh, I know my girlfriend lives in New, uh, New Orleans area and they're doing every other day in school. So everybody has a different strategy. I, I'm not sure what the answer is because we still have to protect the teachers. Um, I know that some of the faculty at the universities are being offered the opportunity to uh, teach remotely, whereas the kids can be together in a class. And that that might work. And the plan is definitely that for all those large classes. I don't know if you guys remember, but my chem class was 200 some people. So um, those are going to be taught uh, remotely. So well, it, it's hard to say what the answer is. I think, if, I think if we can, as I said, curtail the transmission of the disease, then everyone will be protected and I still think that though those kids may need to wear masks and stuff, we just won't know what's going to happen until we actually roll out. And a really interesting concept, one of my best friends is a huge uh, supporter of the Sweden concept, right? So the, the uh, microbiologist, uh, the epidemiologist that's there, um, Mr. Tegnell, has uh, really set what Sweden should do. And they didn't keep their kids home. So if you were 16 and under, you went to school during this pandemic. Um, but if you were older, there was some other uh, things that they did. And if you were sick, you were supposed to stay home. You're supposed to practice social distancing. But what they have now, there's just a couple of papers that were out. What they have now is about a 30%, um, I don't wanna say immunity, but that, that people have maybe that herd immunity concept 
and the kids stayed in school, whereas we see our kids that have stayed been homeschooled and are not where they probably should be uh, at this time or in preparation for next year. So different concepts that are out there and that, that we're just all learning. Unfortunately, this virus really was not like any other virus in, in the way it transmitted, the way it's acting and what we're finding medically. But we also had no idea that the world could come to such a grinding halt and how that impacts not just the economies, but also impacts our kids and, and, and people in terms of, you know, depression, uh, worsening health conditions, you know, obviously the domestic abuse um, and the economy and, um, and also affecting kids, our future and, and how they learn. It's, it's, yeah. it's been pretty devastating. Yeah. Just really quickly, one other quick question. As a medical expert, do you feel that enough of us are getting um, the proper ways to get the masks? It comes back to what um, Vanda and I was talking about earlier, because I know that like whether you go to the, the um, convenience store, that's actually where I got one of my masks, the ones that you put on your, uh, just attached to your ear. But then I've also gone out where people are handing out masks. But I, one of my fears sometimes is that we're getting people given the mask because they know that the masks are very important. But I don't know that we're necessarily getting the training in how, how to actually use the mask. So I was just wondering if that's ever a concern of yours, because a lot of these organizations are definitely concerned about masks and they want us to put the mask on our face. But I know we're getting them and they're getting supplied, but I don't know that they're always being supplied by doctors. So one of my concerns is that maybe we're not getting the proper training as to how to use them. Cause I know I sometimes like got this kind of mask and I'll pull it out. They will give it to me when it was at a uh, bus stop and I'm sitting there going like, okay, I'm not exactly sure how it's supposed to be put on. Yeah. So I think, you know, there are plenty of uh, guides online and actually my co-host Sujana Chandrasheka at Dr. Sujana ENT, she's posted um, pictures of how to do the mask and get it on properly. And um, I think the key is to cover your nose and your mouth, not to wear it around your chin. Um, I've seen people do all varieties, you know, when people are like in New York right now, if you're by, if you're crossing the street, you're at risk of getting run over by a bike, right? So you watch the bikers go by, some will wear a mask, some are wearing it under the nose and, and I actually saw some wearing it appropriately. And I think the issue is really that when you're exerting yourself, it's hard to breathe through the mask. Well, welcome to the life of a surgeon or anyone in the OR. Like when you're working hard on somebody or something or doing something, it's a little bit harder, but you can do it uh, and there's no danger. But the, the correct way to wear the mask is to cover your nose and your mouth. Uh, and also not to touch everything at the same time, you know, because the mask is protecting people from you and you to some degree from what's coming, depending on what kind of mask you have. But if you touch everything and then touch your eyes or you touch, you know, take the mask off and you wipe your face, you wipe the sweat off your brow, um, you're not helping yourself. Yeah. We've got to get let uh, Dr. Curran go, uh, but we want to see if Rose has a question for her. Uh, you could also ask about our planning for our Sunday show, but uh, she, you're all set, Rose. Uh, but if you have a question for Dr. Korean, this would be a great time. Well, just just a quick question. I know that we're having um, the president of the ophthalmology, I don't want to say that, anyway, association. So can you tell us uh, what is so dangerous about the eyes um, and how is that, uh, you know, a little preview of what we should know about? Well, just as, you know, it is an airborne illness, uh, respiratory illness, and um, the concern is also that those are secretions, right? So you don't want to touch your mouth, you don't want to touch your nose, you don't want to touch your eyes because you can transmit. Um, early on in New York, uh, during one of the, um, you know, during our surge, there was an ID doctor who got, uh, I believe he's infectious disease ID, that swears he got it through his eyes because he was wearing his mask. He had, you know, so his nose and mouth were covered and he may not have been wearing a face shield and he thinks that he got COVID because of contact, some splash or something to the eyes. So that's why we say it not because there's secretions that you can get on your hands and then you can touch other things and give it to other people, uh, but also just don't introduce anything into your eyes. And I think in general, that's the thing. I, I used to wear contacts. So that was, you know, always don't just touch something and then you touch your contact or something because you would be at risk to get conjunctivitis, which is an inflammation um, of the lining of the eye. So similarly, you know, that's what we're concerned about with the eyes. Thanks. We'll get more info on Sunday. 
Yes. Uh, so remind us again of our guests. So Sunday, 11 to 12, uh, it, she's on call. Uh, Dr. Sujana and myself are the hosts, and we have Dr. Wendy Sinta joining us, and she is the past president of the OBC Medicine Association. And uh, Dr. Tamara Fountain is joining us, and she is the president-elect of the American Academy of Ophthalmologists, and she's an oculoplastic surgeon. Terrific. And we are all going to learn so much as we do on that show. And we'll play an ad for that show later on before we go off the air. So let's let Dr. Korean go. You're back operating and uh, saving lives again. Thank you so much and good luck with everything. All right, you guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye -bye. All right. Just real uh, quickly, just real quickly, Shri, you'll be so glad to know that that message and I know that uh, the doctors of She's On Call will be glad to hear this well, that that message is getting out there so much that yesterday when I did that show that I did in the afternoon, the uh, radio show with Mark Lee, that's the title that they gave it, the IBM.TV folks. But when I did it, I had a guest who was a fair housing expert. She's a civil rights activist, fair housing expert. But I think that she must have uttered that phrase that has become so popular now, which is basically um, wash your hands, wear a mask, and keep social distance. And I think she must have uttered it at least a good 15 to 20 times within the course of the interview, when she's talking about a lot of issues around Black Lives Matter, around a lot of other things, but she did make sure that she got that point in. And I know that she put that out there several times. So she was one of my guests and as a civil rights activist, but she definitely put that out there that she'd heard it enough around the North Carolina area that she was also passing that message out as she was talking about some other more important social things. That's that's great. Uh, well, let's look, take a look at some of these comments. Apollo's watching and says, thank you, Marina. And, and great to see you, Apollo. Tim says, hi, Mark. Greetings from Pennsylvania with the bears and the turkeys. Uh, Makran says, the CEO of India, PM Modi, uh, also wears Modi's masks uh, to cover uh, and covers all the time. As you know, that the American president only is worn a mask once in public. Uh, today, I went to a playground and kids were not social distancing and only one was wearing a mask makes me anxious. I think you're you're right about why you should be anxious. Uh, Daryl in Trinidad, they have a total of 133 cases and eight deaths. The highest weekly number of cases was 40 back in March. So very interesting how different countries and uh, places are dealing with this. So many comments coming in. We just haven't had ch uh, chance or time to go through all of this, uh, but we are so grateful. Rose, what do you think about these folks that we've kind of all come together over the last four months in the middle of this pandemic. It's sort of amazing. I, 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 I'm with one eye looking at some of the comments and it's like, um, it's as though these people like, no, I mean, they see us every day. And I, I was thinking even about your, your parents who join every mm. time and say, hi, you're doing great. You know, that in the, it, it's terrible that you can't see them, but it, you know, through this show, they're seeing you every day. So, yeah. <laughs> and, as a parent, you know, I know that must be really special. And and I guess um, the consistency of the program and I guess the the level of guests and, sub, you know, topics we've tried to cover uh, have, you know, created this interest in, in the show and this following. So it's it's really, great, you know, great to see that. And, 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 thank and it shows that we could do something out of nothing, where which we built. Uh, before we let Mark go, Mark, uh, you were on our show to talk about being an ally of the black community, what we can do, and you gave us great wisdom. Now, it's been about uh, you know 40 days since then. Uh, what are you thinking about as an African-American? What are the things that are in your mind today? Uh, do you worry about uh, the, the attention being paid, good or bad, to uh, the African-American community in all of this? Uh, talk about that, please. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm glad to see our allies doing some great work and things of that nature and definitely continuing to help within this struggle. I'm seeing a lot of the conversation being moved to the forefront, and I'm glad to see that conversation being moved to the forefront. Um, the show that I had yesterday where I mentioned uh, Stella, uh, one of the things that she said that I love, and I actually tagged Rose in this quote and everything that I tweeted um, a couple of days ago, was those who hate, they don't just hate us, they hate all of us. They hate the America they want to be, which is multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and joyful. We want to be the melting pot of promise. In other words, um, she was talking about the fact that, you know, there's this melting pot promise that has been promised forever in the American dream. And a lot of folks that are fighting against that, they don't understand that what we're actually asking for is that melting pot of promise. 
and that promise that had been delivered some time back. I know that I've been recently reading and I was continuing to read earlier today, the book which I had uh, mentioned to y'all on one of my uh, chat uh, comments a couple of days ago called Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee by D. Brown. And it talks about how a lot of these issues that we are facing as African Americans have also been faced by the Native American population and still continue to be faced by the Native American population. We've even seen talk about how many of the Native American population is not being able to even deal with what's going on with uh, the COVID crisis. Cause you know, you're telling people to wash their hands, but if they don't have access to clean water, then that kind of destroys the purpose. Cause you know, you need access to that kind of clean water in order to do that. So definitely I am seeing some great progress in what's going on. I'm seeing some amazing conversations happening. I saw a conversation that took place. I uh, joined a, uh, dance uh, community. It's the Daybreaker dance community. And they usually do some great events um, online as well. So it's like a big dance party online. I've popped in and tried to do a couple of two steps that I'm not a good dancer, but I tried to do a couple of two steps here and there. But the organizers of that who are from New York actually did like a whole conversation about racism and things of that nature. So they were even using their platform to ma to maintain this conversation and to continue this conversation. So I was really glad to see them do that. And I'm seeing other organizations do this on a regular basis. So, I mean, it's a conversation that had to take place and needed to take place. And I'm so glad that it is taking place. On a separate note, and I just want to say that before I uh, pop off and everything, I have actually had some amazing uh, classes because of what's been going on. Because like you say, you should always take this time to do some things that you might not usually do. So I've had three um, classes and uh, two of the classes are because of you because I did do the uh, contact tracing class and I was with John Hopkins. And by the way, John Hopkins was part of the amazing medical team that was able to pull off that TBD tournament that I referred to earlier. But the other two courses that I took were your course on social media and all of that. And I'm glad that I got my certificate. So yes, I have my fundamentals of social media certificate. So I'm very glad that I was able to complete that course and do well in that course. And then um, we heard earlier, Tim was making some comments and he was offering some uh, classes and some opportunities as well. So I took Tim Sohn's class and I know that he was one of your producers also. So uh, two of the classes I was able to get was because of uh, learning about them through your program. So I just wanted to thank you for that because like I said, I don't know when I'm gonna get a chance to get up to New York and meet the lovely Rose and the great tree, but I am definitely looking forward to doing it. And I just have to share this with you, just a real quick thing. But um, I was talking, this might've been months ago, but I was talking to a friend of mine who does this King kind of platform. She does a daily talk. Her name is um, Pat Murray and she does a Bull City Notes, which talks about what's going on in our city of Durham. And I was just having a quick conversation with her. And I mentioned that I had met you through this platform and then we become what I consider friends. And without a pause, she was like, you know, Shri? So apparently, you know, you're like this world famous person that I didn't even know of your kind of like ties to the social media community because I just mentioned your name and all of a sudden she was like, you know, Shri? How do you know Shri? And she just wanted to know how we were connected and things of that nature. So uh, your reach is a lot further than you think. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so grateful, Mark, for your friendship, for your support. It is important that uh, folks in the African-American community reach out and respond when people are, uh, you know, when they're able to, to respond and participate, and you've been doing that. We've had other friends who've said, you know, uh, they only want to do so much. They don't want to be the black friend who's always called uh, to answer questions, but you've been doing that. But you also represent North Carolina so well. You long before uh, you would come on here to talk about racial justice issues, you would come on to talk about uh, the importance of all the things happening in North Carolina. So we're very grateful, and we'll let you go, Mark. Thank you so much. No problem. Glad to be on the show. Glad to talk to you, and I'll see both of you later. Thank you. Bye bye. And that's great, great Mark. He's so much, uh, you know, he's so friendly and just so, he's got so much energy and always positive. That's, yeah. that's a great thing. Look at Shiva's comment. Uh, congrats, Sri, superb job, 125 shows. And every one of the shows I watched has been very high quality with great guests. And you're an excellent and empathetic host. Thank you, Sh Shiva from Cupertino. And he's one of the folks who we know has been watching as well. So uh, we should let you go, Rose. Uh, tell us what you're working on these days, apart from your writing. Do you have a poem nearby I, can i let you give you a chance to go get a poem because i think it would be a good i'll take you off screen so you can get one is that okay 
that's fine. <laughs> All right, okay, so uh, Rose is gonna come back with a poem in our hand, which is very exciting. And uh, I just wanna thank everybody for being here, for supporting us through all of this. Uh, I have learned so much, 125 episodes. It's hard to even imagine that number. And we want to hear from you. Who are guests that you'd like to hear from? Let me show you some guests, uh, some shows that are coming up, including tomorrow morning show, which is very exciting. It's about art in the time of COVID. Laura Mega, Claudia Pacararo from Rome, Maliki, uh, Malaki from Lima, and Navid Azimi from Rome and Tehran. Uh, they're all gonna be here with us to talk about a fabulous project called Project Lazaro, Art Doesn't Sleep, the global art project during quarantine out of Rome. Next edition is July 23rd, 2020, so you won't wanna miss this. So please tune in and join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern as we talk about this uh, un a really unusual story. And then I wanna tell you that we have on Thursday, Christian Amanpour, yes, from CNN. She'll be with us Thursday, noon to one, Eastern time as I interview her and you can watch on the Harrington School channels of the University of Rhode Island or on my channels. And then at 10 p.m. Eastern, Laurie White Tarakani will be with us as we replay that episode, break it down. We'll also have uh, uh, Dean Jen Riley with us. It's going to be a fabulous show. So meet Christian Amanpour on Thursday, folks. You don't want to miss that. And Rose and I are working on that uh, show as well. So that's on Thursday. Meet Christian Amanpour. All right. I think Rose is ready with a poem. She's always smiling and ready. And there she is. Uh, thank you, Rose. Uh, we're going to read a poem. We have had a disproportionate, I would argue, uh, amount of poetry on this show. Not that we are, are complaining in any way, but that's because Rose cares about poetry. I care, but not like Rose does. Rose uh, has been so great at injecting the arts into our shows. And this is why people should participate. If she was, she could have been, you know, as part of my uh, my my circle, she could have been just somebody watching, uh, sitting on the sidelines and she jumped in and participated and was able to guide us in so many ways. But one of the ways is injecting poetry, getting great guests. She got us Sapphire, she got us Nikki Grimes. She, uh, through her husband, got us uh, one of the funniest episodes ever where we laughed and laughed where we talked about children's kid, uh, children's book authors who were fantastic. So uh, I'm just always gonna be grateful to Rose, no matter what happens, we'll always have had these four months of amazing creativity, energy, and poetry. So let's hear something from you. Okay. I, I don't have my own book with me, so I'm gonna read, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna read a poem by Marie Ponceau uh, from a book called Spring. And Marie Ponceau, um, there's no matter what age you are, you know that you can really become known even in old age because I think it wasn't until she was eight, 89 she won the National Poetry, the National Book Prize for Poetry. For so just remind us, so she did not, uh, when did she start writing though? Much earlier, right? Or I mean, Yeah, she, she studied at Columbia. She studied, um, I think, medieval or Renaissance poets. Um, and... And then uh, published this uh, was published by her first book was published by uh, with Allen Ginsberg um, with Lawrence Fer Ferenghetti as part of that series. Uh, and then she proceeded. And she had seven children. Uh, lived in Paris. Her husband was a, an artist, and um, I think she lived in Algiers. She was there during the, the World War II, and uh, and then she's been teaching. You know, and then she. She translated, to, to keep her kids alive, she translated many uh, thousands, hundreds of French fairy tales for Golden Books. And I met her as a professor at Queens College in a, a writing, creative writing class, because I've, I've been writing poetry since I'm, I'm eight. So, <laughs> and uh, we had this friendship from when I was um, 20 to, to now. You know, she, she, she made it to uh, a, a celebration we were having for her in April, April, like, I don't know, she died like three weeks after that. She made it to this celebration where we each read a poem for her. Uh, so, you know, and um, I've been honored to have Sapphire on the show and Nikki Grimes, and we were working on some other poets as well. 
perspective. Yeah, I just wanted to say that you, every time you've shared the story about uh, her, it's kind of incredible. And maybe we'll do one day just a gathering of her students and friends and do a, a, a reading. And it just reminds me because you said she made it to that night where you were honoring her and then she passed away after. It reminds me that Milton Glaser, the, uh, the great graphic designer and artist, uh, died on his 91st birthday. You know, some people hear that and say, "Oh, so sad he died on his 91st birthday." What a, what so much better than dying on your, you know, the day before. And uh, and 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 he was amazing. And by the way, I'm wearing this shirt. It says "Art for Life," and that was designed by Milton Glaser and given to me on uh, on in September at an event at the Rubin Museum of Art. And I'll never forget meeting him. And he's a he's a folk he's a he folks you might know him as the designer who made the famous "I Love New York" T-shirt. And the and the logo and all of that, but uh, we're now about to hear poetry from Rose yeah. Horowitz. I'll follow her. Yeah, Rose so Horowitz, thirty one. With this show that I missed, I have an old email, uh, an old uh, email address, and I missed that they did a Zoom call where everybody read this year another poem from Marie and her. So we'll do our own because you missed it. We'll do our own. Okay, you'll pick a date in August, <laughs> and we'll do that. Okay. Cool. Um, here's the first poem from this book. Uh, which is the cover, which is called Springing. And that's the one I think she won in maybe, I'm trying to think what year, she won the National Book Prize Award. Okay, old jokes appreciate. Up the long stairs I run, stumbling, expectant. Impatience is hopelessly desperate. Hope takes time. Sort out the private from the personal advance on losses at a decent pace. Aside from all that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like the play? <laughs> um, and here's, here's a, I'll read just a short- By the way, just to mention, since yeah. you mentioned the name Lincoln, this is, is one of the surreal parts of this presidency and this time is that the president keeps discovering that Lincoln was a Republican and thinks nobody knows that. Uh, he doesn't, he's never read a history book, so he doesn't know uh, that uh, Lincoln was in fact a Republican. Yes. Uh, and here's the poem. Let's see, I'm trying to get it quickly, but um, it's, it's a poem by Muriel Rukeyser, great, one of our great poets. And uh, it's, I'll read from this, Theory, it's from Theory of Flight, and it says, from preamble. Earth, bind us close and time, nor sky deride how violate. We experiment again. In many Januaries, many lips have fastened on us while we deified the waning flesh. Now fountains spout for us, mother, fair children, lover, yet once more, in final effort toward your mastery. Stop there. <laughs> Stop. Thank you. That's, uh, that's beautiful. Look at this lovely comment from Apollo who says, you guys have been an awesome oasis during the pandemic of social social desert. Uh, um, and uh, just, just a, a great thought. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, let's, uh, let's uh, call it a day. Otherwise, we'll just keep going. Uh, <laughs> Rose, we have a, a, a lot of other things we're working on. We're working on the Christian Amanpour event on Thursday. So we want everybody to come to that if they can. And uh, we also want everyone to watch She's On Call on Sundays at 11. And so we're gonna play the ad from She's On Call and then we will be done. Uh, here we go. Hi, I'm Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar. I'm an ear, nose and throat surgeon in New York City and New Jersey. And I'm Dr. Marina Kurian. I'm a general surgeon in New York City area. We'd like to introduce you to our new show, She's On Call. We air live on social media platforms from 11 a.m. to noon every Sunday, Eastern Time. We discuss the medical topics of the week. We have two great guests, experts in their field that help us analyze and look at some of the topical issues of healthcare. And we are on 11 to 12, so please join us. We'd love to answer your questions, so please share and watch and send us your questions and comments. See you Sundays at 11. All right, so that's the 
that's the ad uh, for the show. We hope everybody will tune in and uh, and just follow on Facebook at She's On Call, and you can see the archive uh, there as well. And we have several comments that have come in, including uh, an important comment from our friend Daryl, who says, I haven't heard any of your poems, Rose. Uh, would love to, during one of these shows speaking for the entire class. <laughs> we all would. So I think uh, during the uh, Murray Ponceau event that uh, she is uh, cooking up, we will uh, we will have Rose reading as well. I think that would be cool. And uh, uh, Apollo says that was an amazing uh, bio and uh, and an amazing introduction. So uh, we'll show up. So that's uh, that's great. Thank you all for being here. There's a lot. Uh, there was a question here. Makran asked about what was the kids' event. Can you just remind us about the children's book authors who came? And that was very early in this process. Yes. It, well, it was show number thirty-seven because my husband. Yes, you said that. <laughs> but it was um, my husband Alan Katz, who um, is the author of "Taking Out of the Bathtub" and other silly dilly songs, uh, and Dan Gutman, who is the author of "The Magic." Um, no. Uh, the school, uh, what's the series? Um, oh my God. Um, the school, mm, it's it's a great series. Uh, it's like the school, it's not the magic school bus, but it, it's a great series about kids in school and, and all the mischief and every title rhymes. <laughs> uh, and also um, Peter Larangis, who who's a great writer of a little older books and, and was a former actor. And uh, we also had, uh, a woman author whose name I'm not remembering at the moment, but I, I'll I'll uh, tweet out a uh, a link to that show, and it was it was just very funny because they were all talking about, um, but they all knew each other from different you know book book events that have been of course uh, you know on hold, uh, and they were just chatting about their books and you know ribbing each other, and it was a lot of fun. It was just great, uh, to, get great okay. to hear uh, all of them. And uh, we've said on these shows that we must laugh, otherwise we will cry. And we laughed and laughed and laughed. It was a, a wonderful uh, afternoon. So with that, let's say goodbye. We've uh, reminded people of our events coming up tomorrow. is 10 a.m. It's a different time. We're going to be talking about uh, something unusual, about art made during the pandemic and how you can participate in this light projection show that they're doing. It's called Art in the Time of COVID, and you can find it on Instagram, Lazaro underscore art doesn't sleep. Lazaro underscore art doesn't sleep. 10 a.m., we're gonna go to Rome, we're gonna go to Lima, and uh, it'll be a fabulous morning, so that's at 10 a.m. tomorrow. And then on uh, Thursday, we have Christian Amanpour, uh, commander of the British Empire is what CBE stands for after her name, and that's at noon Eastern, you can watch her live, me interview her live, or you can watch at 10 p.m. Eastern when I will be uh, with Lori uh, White Tarakani and Jen Riley talking about interviewing uh, Christian Amanpour. So that'll be a fabulous show. Please join us for that. And before we go, let's look at some of these stats, which are amazing. And we're very proud of these stats. We had uh, in our first 125 shows, we had 1 million viewers, 234 guests, including 143 women, uh, doctors, nurses, doc uh, authors, journalists, CEOs, founders, teachers, and professors. And uh, I just want to make the point, Rose, as you have been one of our best bookers of guests, uh, why it is that it matters, um, the diversity of our speakers, as well as the fact that we focus so much on women uh, through this. Why is it important? because we're the voices that people don't hear. Uh, and unless, you know, you call them at those voices out and you show them and you, you know, what I tried to do with Women to Follow was to amplify the voices of women that, you know, because most people follow men on Twitter, you know, on social media. Even women, right? Even women follow that's, with men. That's yeah. what really got me going. Um, that uh, I think it's 72, you know, this study done in, in DC of all the journalists, like, 3,500 had shown that um, not only do 72% of the men, of the men, uh, you know, question, surveyed, follow and retweet other men, but 72% of the women. <laughs> so, you know, this is, so this is sort of a call, my tweet that started, this was a call to action for everybody to uh, name 
uh, women that they follow. And uh, it's been it's been going that that tweet. And uh, but the the idea and the idea on the show when he was three and he's really been he you know he took a pledge to never be on an all male panel. So I know that he's missed just this week the really cool panel that he wanted to be on, um, but he didn't. And um, and we. Hope to have uh, Gina Glantz, who's the founder of Gender Avenger, and uh, is a real uh, and, and and believes numbers matter. Uh, and now I see they've done a new initiative where they have an app that will also um, track uh, the number of uh, African American or minority guests on on in different panels. Uh, so now that that's supposed to, so if you follow them, you're supposed to be having at least twenty five percent. Um, of, you know, of somebody who's uh, a black African American, you know, an African American or a Latina, I think. So um, I'm eager to hear about that. And, uh, you know, so the idea, so so we've been doing that on the show and we've been doing that before um, the George Floyd killing uh, and, you know, consistently as, as you, you know, and it's, it's a big effort because you have to make another 10 calls maybe to get, you know, the, the right guess or the, the guests that you think you should be showing and that matter. And it, it really does, and you've been amazing. So Rose, I'm gonna let you go. I'm gonna uh, do some more uh, um, promotion work, and then uh, we'll also do our uh, our saying, saying their name, so we'll do that. So thank you very much, Rose. I wanna say to you, as I said to Vandana, you are really amazing. You work so hard for uh, your family, and you work so hard for all of us, your online family as well. And I'm just so proud to know you and to see all the things that we've been able to, to do together. I couldn't have done it without a, without you. The She's On Call, this show, uh, the work we're doing with a couple of the other projects, including the Carnegie Corporation and the University of Rhode Island, all of that, Rose, is uh, watching you learn new tools, but also always at the heart of it, being a journalist and a storyteller. That's what's been awesome. So I'm, I'm, I'm so honored to work with you every single day. Well, thank you, Sri. It's really been um, a joy. And I've gotten to, to meet some of your professors you know, that you've had on the show. And one night, um, uh, Linda and I were chatting and said, oh, you should do more of this. These people are so have so much wisdom to share. You know, you do, do one of these a month, he said. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's- You know, you shouldn't give me any ideas because we'll end up doing that. So <laughs> thank you. Well, anyway, it's been it's been great uh, experience and I've learned so much from you, Sri, so thank you. Thank you, Rose. Everyone follow her, Rose Horowitz 31 on Twitter, at Rose Horowitz 31 on Twitter. She's amazing. And we're looking for your story ideas, guest ideas. Please email us, every single one of you, email us. Uh, if we're looking for sponsors and speakers, as well as uh, looking for guest ideas. And now to our portion of the show where we say their names. This comes from our conversation with Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term intersectionality. And she said that we should, I asked her, what can we do as allies? And she said, say their names. And you might remember the cover of uh, Time Magazine, where Titus Kaffer made this extraordinary, breathtaking painting. And on the right is a picture of young George Floyd with his mother, Larcinia. And she would die two years to almost the day that he would be killed. And now they are buried next to each other in Houston. He died, of course, in Minneapolis. So we've been reading the names of men and women. And for the last few days, Thanks to the efforts of Rahajan and others on our uh, in our audience who said, let's say her name, we're gonna do just that. Names mentioned in the updated version of the Say Her Name report, these are victims of police violence and just each one is a story and a tragedy. Brianna Taylor, Tatiana Jefferson, Sherlina Siobhan Lyles, Corin Gaines, India Kager, Sandra Bland, Alexia Christian, Maya Hall, Megan Hockaday, Janisha Fonville, Natasha McKenna, Tanisha Anderson, Aura Rosser, Shanique Proctor, Michelle Cousseau, Pearly Golden, Gabriela Navarez, Yvette Smith, Renisha McBride, Miriam K. 
Carey, Kayim Livingston, Kayla Moore, Shelly Frey, Melissa Williams, Shulena Weldon, Alicia Thomas, Chantel Davis, Charmel Edwards, Rekia Boyd, Sharice Francis, Aliana Stanley Jones, Tarika Wilson, Alberta Spruill, Kendra James, Latanya Haggerty, Margaret Laverne Mitchell, Taisha Miller, Don Danette Daniels, Frankie Ann Perkins, Sanji Taylor, and Eleanor Bumpers. Every time I say those names, I'm just struck by how many stories we don't know and how many names we don't know and how many people who are still suffering in this country. This pandemic has brought to us the importance of, of, of equality and paying attention and being empathetic. And we're seeing not enough of that in this country. And this country is paying a severe, severe price. I just wanna show you that very early on, this was where the pandemic was. And this was uh, the date here. Let me find the date so I can show it to you. Uh, was March 16th, right when we started the show. And look where the United States is. Look where South Korea is. Look where China is. And look where we are today. We are on top of this list. The, this president is probably proud of, uh, of having uh, America, as he says, being make America great again. But he should be ashamed of where we are on this list. Uh, not on that that chart, but let me show you where the numbers uh, ended up going and look at where the United States was in April. And if you told me that July 22nd, we would still be at the top, I wouldn't have believed you, but here we are. We couldn't have had a worse pandemic as a country, as a people. No country has had it worse than America. And it's a failure of the federal leadership of this president it's a failure of this, of so many governors. It's a failure of media, failure of technology, failure of the healthcare system. And at, at the very heart of it, a failure of understanding the role of science and, and honesty and facts in everything we do. And this particular president is, is held responsible for this by me and so many others. And tonight is an election night in America. It's a primary night where you're seeing uh, a kind of, all of it's a kind of referendum on, uh, on President Trump. And you're seeing where some places where he will uh, pay the price or his candidates will pay the price and others where they won't. And you saw that in Alabama where Jeff Sessions is handpicked attorney general who he fired and you might remember uh, uh, Jeff Sessions was the very first senator to support Donald Trump. And he was rewarded with the attorney generalship and then uh, was fired because he did not, because he recused himself. He did the law abiding thing to recuse himself from the investigation. And, uh, and instead he was fired. And then he ran for his old Senate seat and was uh, a, 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 a Tommy Tuberville, a uh, American foot high school, uh, sorry, college football coach, uh, endorsed by Trump, won that election today, the primary. So we'll see. He's going to be up against Doug Jones, who won that memorable 2018 victory against Roy Moore and all the craziness uh, that was in in that Alabama race. So we're going to see a lot of interesting things. Sarah Gideon just uh, won the Democratic primary in Maine, and I tweeted about her, and I said that uh, she's going to be in one of the most important races. Uh, she's the Speaker of Maine's House of Representatives and is now going to take on Senator Susan Collins in one of the most watched races in November. Her father is an immigrant from India. Her mother is second-generation Armenian-American. So that was on my Oops, you can't see that very well uh, because it's too bright, but it's uh, at Sri on Twitter. Please follow me and please connect. Please follow our YouTube channel, SriNet, and please stay in touch. Please email me if you have any questions, suggestions, topics, or sponsors that you want to tell us about. A big shout out to our friends at Scroll for always 
rebroadcasting our shows and uh, and reaching such a great audience all over the world. So with that, we'll say goodbye. We have uh, an early show tomorrow, 10 a.m. Eastern, and then on Thursday, Christian Amanpour. You don't want to miss it. Thanks very much, everybody.